now friends we are discussing extraction of titanium from ilmenite we have talked about three basic routes one is where we smelt ilmenite in an electric furnace using carbon as a reductant we produce pig iron if there is some chromium and vanadium in the ore that can also go there and the titanium diode part tio2 part will go into the slag so we'll go a, get a titaniferous slag that will have the advantage this process will have the advantage that the carb iron value is taken care of and from the slag we will have to extract titanium by chlorination the other methods were such that we were not making good use of the iron value one will be if you partially reduce um, the ilmenite so that only iron part is reduced you produce metallic iron then you rust it off reject it you have tio2 you do whatever you want to do with tio2 the other will be strong acid leaching you leach out iron part it get rejected you have tio2 now you will find again and again we are coming back to the question of having tio2 then making a halide out of it and then see how we can get titanium from it because tio2 you cannot reduce by carbon to produce titanium you will produce titanium carbide now in the case of beryllium oxide we did a trick we reduced beryllium oxide by carbon in presence of a lot of copper so that we produced a beryllium copper alloy which has very low percentages of beryllium so that beryllium will no longer form carbide by reaction with carbon because the activity of beryllium is very low and because we produced a beryllium copper alloy the activity of beryllium was low so the beryllium oxide reduction was driven to the right made very easy we also had an advantage we produced beryllium copper alloy which is what is required in the industry to make springs beryllium copper springs this will not do for titanium oxide because we can't think of some other metal which will form an alloy with titanium for which we have need so titanium dioxide reduction by carbon is not a feasible proposition now couple of lectures ago when i had started talking about halide uh, formation and reduction i said the following things which i think you can appreciate it better when you have a metal oxide very often we reduce it in presence of carbon to produce a chloride why do we do that because why do you need a carbon because when the oxides are far too stable then without carbon they will not form the chloride thermodynamically it is not feasible but if you bring in a reducing agent you can think of a two step process that reducing agent reduces the oxide the metal is released and that reacts with chloride to form a, a chloride now i put both in terms of co2 and this because the two reactions feasible i think there is something wrong somewhere here one should be a 2 co um yeah this should be this this should not be there 2 co so depending on at what temperature this is happening please correct it to 2 co uh, either this reaction will predominate or this if you go beyond 900 or 1000 you will have uh, more of co and at lower temperatures will have more of co2 so that's why i'm saying that if sufficient carbon is present then co by co2 ratio is governed by the temperature again relatively less stable oxides can be chlorinated without use of carbon but when they are oxides are stable 
you will need carbon. I will come back to this question in relation to, to titanium and why do we go for metallothermic reduction of halides which you have done for uh, uranium, plutonium, thorium and do for titanium also. Because first of all in oxygen free operation if you produce the metal then there is no question of oxygen, oxygen impurities which ruins the properties. The choice of reduction method I am again and again saying it will not only depend on thermodynamic feasibility that is free energy change. It will also depend on the heat balance means exothermicity. It will also depend on kinetics the, the, the forms in which the reactants and the products are there and the temperature they will define kinetics at the rate at which it will happen. It will depend on melting and boiling points of constituents, densities of metal and slag. I have given uh, quite a few examples of that, this and again and again you see in the case of uranium we found that uranium oxide can also be reduced, but there are lots of halides and very often it is the calcium uh, reduction of an halide which helps us. Sometimes we use the booster reaction which provides heat and also it provides a constituent which mixes with uh, the slag to produce a low melting slag. So, the reaction is driven to the right. In the case of plutonium we have also this reduction. Then you come in the case of thorium again fluorides and chlorides can be reduced by calcium and magnesium all very similar. In this case we are using calcium chloride so that we have the flux at a lower melting point. Now, let us come to this question why we want carbon sometimes for chlorination and sometimes we do not need carbon. I have, I have said and I am repeating when the oxide is very stable it is very difficult to chlorinate it without presence of carbon. If it is unstable it may be possible. We can look at it from the free energy point of view through a very simple analysis. Now, in this uh, thing I am sorry you will often find that uh, I have not been able to use the same kind of style of lettering because too complicated. You know <coughs> sometimes O is small, O is large and there could be some other mistakes also. Please um, you should understand what I am trying to say there could be some errors. All the P's are small P's because they are partial pressures. If anywhere there is a capital P it is wrong I think the one or two places is there. Let us consider a reaction of TiO2 with chlorine to produce titanium tetrachloride vapor and the reaction is TiO2 plus 2 Cl2 producing TiCl4 and oxygen gas. So, oxygen comes out chlorine attaches itself to titanium. This is a simple reaction that we can write. Now, at 1000 degrees we know that the standard free energy change is minus 132 kilo calories per mole of TiCl4 sorry this should be 4. <coughs> not TiCl2, this is 4, I am correcting again. We also know from thermodynamics that delta G is written as delta G naught plus RT, let us consider the reaction at 1000 degrees, ln K, there should be a ln here, the ln is missing, L n sorry, ln K. R T ln L n K. So, this is P O 2 into P T i C L 4 activity of T i O 2 P C L 2. <coughs> Under standard conditions this will be 1 and uh, it, if atmosphere 1 atmosphere is 1. Now, assume that the reaction takes place that is happens. Supposing this is happening, which means delta G naught is less than 0. Now, we can 
find out that the condition for this turns out to be P T C I 4 by P C L to be 1.25. Means, you will produce a ratio of P T I C L 4 by P C L to 1.25. If the total pressure is 1 atmosphere, then this calculates to be 0 0.13 atmospheres. You can easily find this by simple calculations that you know in the product you have uh, a total pressure of these if you take one atmosphere, this will come out to be 0 0.1 0 0.3 atmosphere. Thus, without carbon there is not much conversion because you are producing a titanium tetrachloride please see make it 4, which is only 0 0.3 atmosphere and this would be please ln, correct it ln. Sorry, there is a mistake that should be ln here also ln, ln, I will correct it. So, now consider a reaction where T i O 2 is being chlorinated in presence of carbon for this delta G naught is minus 76 kilocalories. Delta G naught can be written as R T ln, there will be a ln here and obviously, P C O square P T H C I 4 P square C L 2 A T I O 2 and A C square. We can take this activity as 1, this activity as 1 will be reduced to 3. Uh, partial pressure terms. Now, for delta G naught equal to 0 for equilibrium, we will calculate P cube T C I 4 by P square C L 2 would be this value. And since all these sums up to 1 atmosphere, we can say that P C O would be 2 P C L 4, because these two must have the same partial pressure if you see here. Anyway, finally, if you go through all this, you follow that and only make this correction long, I will correct it by typing. We will finally find that P C L 2 value comes out to be 5.7 10 to the minus 2 atmosphere, which means all that chlorine that has that you have reacted 99.9 percent .9 has conversion of chlorine to tetrachloride. So, after the reaction, there is hardly any chlorine left means all, all has been converted to tetrachloride. So, you can do it yourself and show that if you put in carbon in the system, the conversion of TiO to TiCl4 is far more. Now, I am showing you a slide now, a reactions which I remember mentioning in my very first lecture when I started this series of lectures. I had given this example to indicate how in metallurgy when we write a reaction, we look at things differently from than when we write the reaction in a course in chemistry. So, in a chemistry class we can write T i C L 4 reacts with magnesium to produce titanium and M G C L 2. We can write sodium reacts with T i C L 4 T i solid and force N A C L that is the end of the matter. We cannot do that in metallurgy. We have to understand how these reactions take place, because the fact of the matter is when one reduces T i C L 4 liquid by magnesium liquid, you produce a solid titanium solid, which is powdery in nature. Its physical characteristics very unsatisfactory, it is powdery in nature. It has to be consolidated again by vacuum melting. Whereas, when we reduce titanium tetrachloride vapor by sodium vapors at 1000 degrees, this takes place at 800 degrees, 
we get a metal which is crystalline. It's almost like what happens in electrodeposition. In an electrodeposition, when a metal is deposited from its ion, ions are discharged. Then when another ion is discharged, it builds on to the metal and in it goes into the crystal lattice. You produce a solid metallic layer which you call a crystalline product. Of course, there are some situations where it does not happen, you got metallic particles, it is also a powdery deposit. But ideally, you should be able to produce a crystalline cathode product if there is a proper electrochemical reaction under correct uh, uh, conditions. So, in chemically, you are reducing this by magnesium reducing agent, you are reducing titanium tetrachloride by sodium, but the products are very different. In one case, it is a crystalline product, in one case, it is a powdery product. So, in metallurgy, in process metallurgy, we have to stop here to think why it happens, can we control it, can we try to produce in this reaction something which is not powdery or here what should we do to ensure that uh, we the crystalline product is crystalline, so, things like that. So, Hunter's process which was the first process gave a superior product, but Kroll's process has its advantages advantage here is it will be at a lower temperature. We are dealing with liquids, there are two liquids, another liquid a solid, whereas here we are dealing with gaseous reactants, one solid, one liquid. The moment you have gaseous reactants, your entire reactor um, shape and details change. So, we will rather have uh, magnesium reduction, but the product is not very good, this is the problem. Now, lot of work now has been done to analyze why, why we have this difference. Now, first of all, and this I had mentioned in the first lecture itself, you can write an overall reaction like this, but this can never be the reaction simple logic tells us why it cannot be the reaction. What does this imply? It implies four atoms of sodium gas phase is reacting with one molecule of titanium tetrachloride in the gas phase. Imagine a reactor full of gaseous sodium atoms and gaseous titanium tetrachloride atoms. Now, they are moving around these gas particles. <coughs> For four atoms of sodium to react with one molecule of titanium tetrachloride, they have to come at one point. Even if they do not have to hit exactly at one point, they have to be in the vicinity for a reaction to take place. The probability of this is almost 0. Imagine it is so difficult in the gas phase for two particles to come and come at one point because they are flowing all over the place. To have five of them come to one point, probability is almost 0, which means such penta molecular reaction in gas phase we cannot accept by common sense. Then what? what then can we say the reaction does take place? Well, we can propose and then find out whether what we are proposing is correct. What we propose is that the sodium reduction involves subchlorides. Subchloride means this is not the reaction, this is the overall reaction. We have other reactions like sodium 1 atom reacts with one molecule of titanium tetrachloride. I am not writing the gas phases now, these are in gas phases, it produce a trichloride. This reaction is possible, yes, in the gas phase two of them come and collide and produce this. And then two TiCi3, three, two molecules of this can come together 
and produce TiCl2 and TiCl4 to generate TiCl4. Two sodium can react with one TiCl2. It is ter molecular reaction, definitely much better than a penta molecular reaction. We can think of another bimolecular reaction sodium, titanium, trichloride, titanium dichloride, and sodium chloride. Do you understand what I am trying to say? Now, there is something more to this. If you go back to this reaction, we have one liquid phase sodium chloride. Now, careful analysis of the sodium chloride during the reaction has shown that it does contain trace amounts of this trichloride, dichloride. So, essentially what happens once two of them react and produce a trichloride molecule, it dissolves in sodium chloride. Now, sodium can react with the liquid phase where there is uh, titanium trichloride and reduce it to titanium. If there is a dichloride, it also dissolves in sodium chloride liquid phase, it has been detected. So, sodium can react with the dichloride, produce titanium and sodium chloride. Sodium can react with traces of titanium trichloride to generate dichloride, sodium chloride, etcetera, etcetera. So, essentially, it is a beautiful concept that you sodium initially somehow produces certain amount uh, a reaction trichloride, dichloride, which are now in sodium chloride. Now, the sodium atoms vapor phase are reacting with that liquid and reducing. So, they do not have to search around in the in the chamber looking for a, a gas molecule of titanium tetrachloride. And the proof of that is that those phases have been detected. Those phases have been detected uh, in small quantities in sodium chloride. So, you see here is the here is the explanation of something which looks so illogical if you do not go deep into the so called mechanism. Now, when it comes to magnesium reaction, well it is a ter molecular reaction, but here everything is taking place in liquid state. Titanium is producing one particle at a time. The reaction takes place, titanium is produced, another place titanium is produced, and they do they do produce a dispersion of titanium. Now, coming back to sodium reaction, I have explained how it cannot be a pentamolecular reaction, but wh why should it make give a crystalline product? That question remains. So, let me go back to that question. Now, it has been shown now that sodium reaction with titanium trichloride vapor to give titanium solid and sodium chloride liquid actually is an electrochemical reaction. Now, what is an electrochemical reaction? Consider the electrochemical the corrosion of iron, we call it galvanic corrosion. In that there is a cathodic site there is an anodic site. In the anodic site, iron forms ferrous ion produces electrons, there is an uh, there is a this, this, this is not ionic conductor, this should be electronic conductor. So, the ion electrons can go there and these electrons react with H 2 and half O 2 to produce 2, 2 O H. So, iron reacts with water and oxygen to produce ferrous iron and O H ions. Please change it, it is electronic conductor, there is a metallic body through which electrons are going. So, in the Hunter's process they say there is a similar electronic uh, electrochemical mechanism that sodium in solution in it produces sodium ions and the elect it will go to another site react with titanium to produce titanium solid. In other words, if you have a chamber 
which is not made of a metal, this kind of thing does not happen. So, in the case of sodium reduction, we need metallic conductors, so that titanium can grow as a crystal in those sites where titanium is being deposited. So, the anode reaction in the case of sodium reaction takes place at a metal surface, reactor walls or growing titanium crystal, they themselves can be the anode sites, where sodium metal fused NaCl and chloride ions are available for solvation of the sodium plus ions produced. The cathode reaction also takes place at a metal site elsewhere, where soluble titanium in the fused salt is available and chloride ions are released to complete the anodic reaction. This titanium has to be now available in the fused salt media as subhalides and that is why the anodic reaction is possible. If the reactor walls are made of non-conducting material, then reduction is inhibited. That is the proof that there is an electrochemical mechanism which is aiding sodium reduction. Now, magnesium reduction on the other hand is molecular and it produces powder metal unless there is complete gas phase and prearranged titanium ribbons. We can help the magnesium reduction by putting in the bath titanium ribbons and if we go into the complete gas phase, we can have on titanium ribbons similarly titanium depositing and producing crystalline product, but in the liquid phase it will not be possible. You have to go to a this phase. Okay. So, this now let us move on with the titanium production. How do we produce titanium sponge? We produce TiO2 you have to mix coke, because we are going to chlorinate in presence of carbon. Mixing, kneading, briquetting, drying, coking, chlorination will get crude TCIO4, fractional distillation will remove any SiCl4 that may have been produced. During chlorination, ferric chloride is very easily removed. We degas, take out HCl. Now, we go for magnesium reduction, which is now the process. We do vacuum distillation, finally, we produce titanium sponge. It goes for crushing, blending and gradient titanium sponge. So, today's industry has discarded the sodium process, because magnesium is a more convenient uh, uh, medium. Even if we do not produce a beautiful product, it can always go for vacuum distillation and consolidation to produce titanium sponge. Okay. We have so far discussed initially reactor metals that were metals which found applications in nuclear reactors. We talked about uranium is fissionable isotope U-235, then the fertile isotope U-238. We talked about U-38 converted to plutonium 239, which is a fissionable material. We talked about thorium converting TH-232 to an isotope of uranium 233, which is a fissionable material. Then we said, we also consider zirconium to be a reactor metal, because we need it in the reactors as a cladding element, zirconium alloys, which allows the neutrons to pass through. It will be very difficult to produce a critical mass, if we had some other material that will absorb neutrons. It allows the neutrons to go through. We also brought in beryllium, which is a moderator, which can slow down neutrons. Now, there are some other metals, which are not nuclear 
uh, reactor metals. Titanium is one of them. We do not use titanium in uh, reactors. It is a reactive metal all the same. Sometimes, some of these are called rare metals. Titanium is not a rare metal, but uranium, plutonium, thorium, these are rare metals, but titanium is a reactive metal. We will talk about two other reactive metals, which also come from halides. In this case, naturally occurring halides. We do not have to make halides out of oxides. The first that comes to my mind is magnesium. Now, do not forget that we have talked about magnesium in the very beginning when we are talking about metals from oxides. Magnesium is produced by pigeons process by reduction of MgO produced by decomposition of dolomite or magnesite. The magnesite would produce MgO, dolomite would produce MgO CaO. Reduce that by ferrosilicon and it produced magnesium vapor which were condensed and collected. That was reduction, metallothermic reduction of magnesium oxide. We did not go for halide. But a lot of magnesium is also produced through the halide route. I am not going to talk about the importance of magnesium. This we have discussed when we are talking about pigeons process, uh, how important magnesium is as a metal, not only for all kinds of alloying, it finds even use in the in the steel industry. That without magnesium we cannot go for nodular cast iron, the spheroidization of graphite. So magnesium also is required in all kinds of light metals, it is used in photography, this and that. So we will not we will not mention again the uses. But we will talk about magnesium from a chloride route. Now, in theory, all chlorides can be produced using electrolytes, all chlorides. And all the things that we talked about, nuclear metals and then titanium, all the halides in theory, we can produce by electrolysis in a suitable halide bath. But the methods I have discussed are more convenient and that is why there is no industrial process based on electrolysis of the halide. But the next two metals I am going to discuss, magnesium and sodium, they are produced by halide reduction. Because they are very stable halides themselves, you cannot think of a metallothermic reduction and that you know calcium or magnesium, no, the halides will be electrolyzed. Now, halide electrolysis industrially is mostly used only for alkali and alkaline earth metals using molten salts and I give you only two examples. First is magnesium. We are not going to talk about the pigeons process, but let us come to where is magnesium chloride coming from. Now, magnesium chloride is available plenty in sea water. Sea water contains magnesium chloride. 0.13 percent magnesium in sea water is a huge amount of magnesium. If you imagine how much of sea water we have and magnesium there is as magnesium chloride. There are some natural deposits of um, some salts where there is magnesium in you know, exposed sea beds. So, this the water has dried out and you have the salts that contain magnesium. We are not going to talk about that. We will talk about industrial process for producing magnesium from sea water. Incidentally, I can mention that right in the very beginning, I had given uh, 
the availability of metals in sea water. Every metal you can think of is available in the sea, because for millennia rivers have been flowing over land and going into the sea. They have carried down from hills and plateaus and land all kinds of material into the sea. From the bottom of the sea also, many metals are coming through cracks at the bottom of the sea from undersea volcanoes. All elements are there. And if you take the volume of the sea, their quantities are enormous. In France, actually, a company tried to extract gold from sea water. They almost succeeded because the amount you go by percentage is very small, but looking at the huge volume of sea, the amount of gold there is unbelievable. They tried to extract, almost made it, but economically it was not sustained. I have also talked about a peculiar source of metals in the sea floor. They were the manganese nodules, which are very, very rich in nickel, cobalt, copper, zinc, etcetera but basically very rich in manganese. If they had gold, the gold prices will crush. But magnesium is found dissolved in water and almost the entire sea everywhere has around 0.13 percent mangan uh, magnesium because the seas are connected. And that is not a small percentage that can be extracted. It is not in parts per million or parts per billion it is 0.13 percent magnesium in sea water. So, there is a very simple way to, of getting that magnesium out. Mag, it is the sea water is treated by lime and you produce magnesium hydroxide, which is precipitated and which after filtration is converted to magnesium chloride in solution you know you can chlorinate and make magnesium chloride in solution. This is evaporated to get MgCO2. So, how magnesium is there in sea water? It could be we cannot say you know after all it could be chloride or whatever, but magnesium is in solution the magnesium ions you precipitate as hydroxide is very easy then chlorinate magnesium chloride and then get pure magnesium chloride it has to be now electrolytically decomposed. It is decomposed using a bath 25 to 30 percent magnesium chloride, 15 percent calcium chloride and 50 to 60 percent sodium chloride. We need a mixture of salts, so that the melting point is low and calcium chloride and sodium chloride are more stable than magnesium chloride during electrolysis. Otherwise, these will get electrolyzed. So, that is not a problem. Magnesium chloride will get decomposed. The cell is like this and try to understand why the cell is like this. This is a graphite electrode, which is a standard electrode for, for chlorine. This electrode has to be isolated because we do not want that the magnesium will be produced and will react with again chlorine which is the anode product. We have to keep the cathode product magnesium and the anode product chlorine separately. So, during electrolysis chlorine will evolve around the graphite electrode and it will escape by this place. Whereas, magnesium will be deposited in this cathode, which is the iron vessel. All around that magnesium will be deposited and magnesium very being very light will float up, it will float up. Now, this magnesium which is floating is completely separated from the chlorine which is being evolved. So, there is no question of back reaction and this whole chamber is flushed with inert gas, so that magnesium produced is collected under an inert atmosphere and there is a way of collecting that magnesium. So, this is a very important 
um, principle here that you are keeping the cathode product and anode product separate from each other. We will always need it when there is a question of back reaction. If you go for aluminum electrolysis, you will also find that aluminum is deposited below the electrolyte. The, the th things are uh, so adjusted that there will be no back reaction between aluminum and CO, CO2 that is coming out. So, all kinds of tricks have to be played. Let us come to production of sodium. Now, sodium is a very useful metal. I have just mentioned a few uses. It is used in sodium vapor lamps. It is a reducing agent in the laboratory. It has a lot of applications in the chemical industry, mostly as an amalgam. A standard method of sodium production is the Downs process. Downs process is based on electrolysis of sodium chloride around 850 degrees. Why 850 degrees? Because sodium will boil at 880 degrees. So, it has to be below the boiling point of sodium. Even at 850 degrees, it will have fairly high vapor pressure, but there are many reasons why it cannot bring down the temperature far too down, but it certainly has to be below the boiling point. Vapor pressure is high and cell design must prevent oxidation of these vapors. There are sodium vapors fairly high at 850 degrees, but they have to be completely separated from the chlorine. Now, the reason is we cannot bring down the temperature too low is that melting point of sodium is 804. It is very tricky. It melts at 804 and it boils at 880 degrees. So, your window is very small, just about 80 degrees. So, we put it somewhere in between. So, we are producing sodium which is liquid, but it has a high vapor pressure because it is not too far from the boiling point. Now, all these things have to be kept in mind in the design of the cell. Now, and also the design of the electrolyte. The electrolyte is a mixture of sodium chloride 42 percent and calcium chloride whose melting point is 590 degrees. So, we bring down the melting point. So, we are sure there is a, um, a liquid electrolyte and we have enough sodium in that and only sodium chloride and calcium chloride. And the Downs process is a continuous reactor that there is continuous addition of dry NaCl and there is a continuous retrieval of sodium metal being produced. How do we do that? Here is the cell. Now, here in the case of magnesium, we had a graphite electrode coming from the top, remember, and there was a chamber all around for collection of chlorine. Here we have a graphite anode that is where chlorine will be evolved. This is the electrolyte. So, when the chlorine is evolved, the chlorine straight away after release goes into the wood and the chlorine will go out. There is you will find a diaphragm that prevents chlorine to move out of the anode chamber and it has no chance of attacking the sodium. The sodium will deposit an iron or copper cathodes as see how they are placed with a hydrostatic device. The moment sodium is produced now being very light it will float up. The sodium metal will be produced this is a cylindrical thing. So, we do not have to show it on this side this thing does not have to be showed on this side. There is a diaphragm the sodium produced cannot move into the electrolyte it only has to float up through the electrolyte same thing here it will also float up through the electrolyte and there is a hydrostatic device sodium metal will come out here and it is usually kept under kerosene something so that it will react. So, here also we have 
a design of a cell which ensures that the anode product chlorine and the cathode product the metal they are completely separated. In this case chlorine deposited here moves out, metal deposited here floats up through this a hydrostatic device and collected. In the case of magnesium chlorine deposited here went out, magnesium fortunately had no problem it floated here and from there it could be collected. Now, this is a continuous process because the sodium chloride is continuously added here, nothing is happening to the calcium chloride part, it is just a supporting electrolyte. So, sodium chloride is continuously deposited, chlorine is continuously taken out and sodium that floats up the hydrostatic device is collected separately, the continuous process. Now, there are also other metals like potassium and sodium can maybe there are other methods also, but I need not cover each and everything in this course. I think I have talked enough about reactor metals and non reactor metals which are produced from the halide root. I will end it there. So, we have discussed about metals from oxides metals from sulphide sources, metals from halides, natural halides like in the case of magnesium or sodium and synthetic halides of uranium, plutonium, thorium, titanium which come from oxidic sources. You must understand that, but I thought it was logical to put them in this category because they are, they are so similar, things are so similar. There is only one category of metal left and I will maybe I will just cover it in one lecture, rather two categories. One is that uh, noble metals that essentially exist in free state, like you know precious metals, gold, platinum series metals, silver. Silver does uh, occur as weak compounds I will discuss, but not gold, not platinum metals. They are essentially all free. That is how at in ancient times they could get gold chunks of gold here and there or particles of gold from river sands. Then there is another category we must not ignore from where we can produce metals and they are called secondary metals from metal scrap. All the metals that we are producing, we are going for some use either in the industry or to the consumers. What happens to them after months or years? Every, every use, every item has a life. After the life, what do you do with the scrap? If you do not do something about it, then you have an environmental problem. So, we will have to recirculate them. So, we have to extract metals from these scraps and metals extracted like that would be called secondary metals. Now, obviously, we have been talking about beneficiation of ores and minerals getting into so much of trouble to bring, bring up the percentages from far less than 1 percent to an acceptable level level so that we can go for extraction processes. When you talk about a scrap, it may be dirty, but imagine its metallic value, it is so high. Whatever scrap, aluminum, copper, zinc, lead, all that iron, all that we have used and we have thrown away, it is very rich in that metal. So, it is far better than trying to extract metals from ores and minerals. And that is why if we process such scrap, we need far less energy. So, they are from an energy point of view 
far more favorable because most of the metals have been extracted anyway. You just have to do a little bit to clean up the things, produce them again to the purity level you want. So, you will save on energy and you will also save the environment because they would not be lying around in the environment doing nothing. So, secondary metals also form a very important category of metals. Actually, you can think of a day when we will not need these methods of producing primary metals, almost very little, because whatever is there as scrap will be recirculated, and then again we produce fresh uh, metals for various uses, they will be consumed, again there will be some scrap, we will reintroduce them. Of course, it cannot be a total recirculation you might have to produce metals to a much lower level. This actually has happened in the case of say steel, maybe 40, 50 or more percentages of steel in United States is coming from scrap, particularly the, the huge numbers of cars they produced and after the cars are discarded after 3, 4 years, you take out all the non-metallic things. The everything is goes into a press made into a small box that goes for steel making. So, it is recirculated. Now, it is not easy in all the cases, but in cases in many cases recirculation is, is a distinct possibility and as there is more development there will be more recirculation. The problem in our country is we are not that developed we have not made available consumer goods to all our people. Elsewhere, the per capita consumption of metals, all kinds of metals at a much higher level than that in India. So, we have to produce more and more of the all the metals I have been talking about, so that our people are developed, they have more goods and services. We need to make available more copper, lead, zinc, aluminum to more and more people and the industry would also develop, they will need more and more of this. So, we will come to the question of recirculation maybe 20 years from now. You, you should understand why the process metallurgy operations have shifted from the advanced countries to countries like ours. There are two reasons for it. First of all, the metallurgical extraction processes are quite dirty. They are labor intensive. They have an impact on the environment. So, the advanced countries have passed this on to us. They have gone into high technologies, into software, advanced electronic equipments, planes, spacecraft. They have gone into high technology and left the the so called lower technologies to us, but we have no choice. We need more metals, we have to produce these ourselves and our industry will depend on how we develop our metal extraction processes. So, we will move into next time um, discussing uh, precious metals and secondary metals. Thank you very much.